Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon. Here's one you won't see every day. This is a mid-1980s Robertson Audio Model 4010 power amplifier. You don't really know much about Robertson Audio because, well, they were a very short-lived company that didn't stick around very long. They had some nice ideas, but uh, poor marketing. And as you can tell, aesthetically, they're not really all that good looking. You won't find many schematic diagrams or any information for servicing these because it really doesn't exist. They're all in the minds of the people that put these amplifiers together, which may or may not still be in existence. But anyways, a customer brought this to me, and it had been in multiple shops. He finally shipped it to me and said, maybe you can figure it out because nobody else can. And he says that one channel does not work correctly. Now if I power it on, and we come over here to the scope here, we see that it plays, but what's with that bobbling? Bobbling that gets progressively worse as the machine warms up. And if we increase the power a little, we see that that bobbling kind of goes away because our sensitivity on our scope is a-okay. If we really crank it, we see that it's soft clips. That's kind of neat, right? Much like an NAD. So, he says it's a time-related thing that gets worse the longer he plays it. And you can see that the left channel is far worse than the right, but both have that bobble. And the longer it's on, the worse it gets. So we're going to try to troubleshoot this one and figure out where the problem is and see if we can't resolve it. But the first step to doing that is getting the covers off this thing. Now the business end of this is on the bottom, so you have to take off the bottom panel. You take off the top panel, you get access to the power supply caps and the transformer. And it's a dual secondary with independent rectifiers for each channel, so that's that's pretty fancy. This uh, wasn't cheap construction. This was a really well-made amplifier, but there's not much on documentation for it. And it looks like they're using a lot of optical coupling here. So your signal comes in here, and these are probably your diff amp pairs, and then we go through a, a coupler here. These are, and I'm not sure what this is. It's all encased in potting compound, so you can't really know what that is. That might be optical coupling too. And then we get into the driver stage. These are your driver transistors up here, and these are your outputs. So we kind of have to follow everything back. And it looks like these are the Class A drivers because these feed directly into the AB drivers there. So what we want to hope is, is that the problem with our noise is not centered around these guys here. Because uh, that would be bad. Uh, what we want to hope for is that they're in these little differential amplifier current source type setup here. Like I said, there's not much uh, documentation on these, so trying to find out what's going on is pretty limited. And they got optical couplers here, which is neat, but they could be a cause of uh, concern too. And then the way they adjust the bias is a little bit odd. Like what's in this thing? <laughs> this thing here shed some light on this maybe yeah so they got this magical thing with an adjustment potentiometer here on the top I assume that's your bias um, so yeah so this one's going to be a bit tricky because we're just kind of flying blind on it but this is kind of where the scope comes in handy because the scope will largely reveal noise in the system we just have to hope it isn't in any of these components that aren't replaceable really because you don't know what's inside. 
All right, so we're powered up. There's our left channel there with all of its glory noise. But the right channel isn't all that great either. And if we boost it a bit, we see that there's lots of weird noise there too. What you have to hope for is that these optical coupler thingies that this thing has aren't the root cause of this. So I'm going to grab my right channel scope probe and we're going to start poking around in here. That's power supply. All right, let's intensify the gain there. You see that there's noise and bobble there. What's odd is that I have not found anything that's a regulated supply voltage yet. Well, that pisses it off. So uh, use the times 10. All right, so nothing, no noise on the scope there. A little tiny bit of bobble there. Power supply there. A little bit on bobble there. A lot of hum on that one. Yeah, so I'm looking at a lot of hum there. I'm thinking there's supposed to be some kind of regulation here, and there ain't. Let's check on the low side of these. Let's look at these optical couplers, too. That's just... Power supply voltage is there. What's on the other side? Power there. Yeah, so I'm not sure what's going on there. If we come up to the bases. Yeah, so our noise is at the bases. All right. Let's go to our little... Class A sealed block thing here. Yeah, there's an there's noise there. Let's go to the input. That's power. Where's the input to this thing? That's power. Good lord. Okay, how do they get the signal into this thing? There must be some sort of differentiation that goes in, but I can't find it yet. Nope, that's not it. It's like I said, flying blind, you don't have a schematic diagram, so where do you know to go? I'm checking all the lines of these Class A things. And there's our noise on the other Class A, too. So it's hard to tell whether the amplifier itself is generating the noise and it's being fed in the feedback loop, or if one of these transistors or these Class A devices are responsible. Let's just check with the other side here. Let's look at the channel that's not noisy. It's bobbling, but it's, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure here. All right, so I think the next thing I'm going to do is bust out our friend the uh, freeze mist and cool some of these components and see if we get a reactive change because uh, <coughs> the left channel for sure is garbage. The right, I mean, they both bobble, so that's the common point is the bobbling probably caused by poor power supply regulation, which I still haven't figured out how they sent feed a regulated voltage into this yet. Anyway, freeze mist time. All right, so I'm going to start by spraying these transistors here, which are probably differential amplifiers. It does shift the DC, but doesn't eliminate the noise. 
to quiet it down a little bit. Let's switch to just one only. Let's go back to that one there. Helpful, but not very. Next one. Yeah, not much change there. Nope. So the transistors really aren't affecting the noise any. So let's move on to these weird optical couplers here. So I'm going to spray the one on the left. No real change there. One on the right. No real change in noise, maybe a little more instability. Okay. So that's not yielding us anything different. So now I'm going to try to cool down these Class A blocks here. And we'll see if that changes anything. Sure is getting a lot noisier. Ooh, didn't like that at all. Yeah, no loose connections. That's entirely internal failure. Let's spray the one on the right. Get that one cooled down. Not much change in the noise there. I think the little transients are just a function of it being on longer. So that's... All right. So that's not helping us either. Uh, my thought is, is that one of these little sealed gizmodroids it's just noisy, and there may not be anything we can do about this. That may be why they couldn't figure it out either. I'm curious to know what's inside these things, but they ain't never going to tell you. Shh. And any one of these, one on the left, yields no change next to it. Yeah, it doesn't really yield any change. I mean, the noise goes down just the tiniest bit. Not enough for it to be significant. Third one really makes the DC swing, though. If I just hose them all. Yeah, I mean, it just... The noise is still there no matter what, no matter what you do. And then if I heat them, I'm just resting my thumb on there so that my body temperature will increase the uh, thermal reactance. It is getting a little worse. All right, let's go to the extreme. Let's use a heat gun. All right, so the purpose in the heat gun is to really heat up these suspicious components here since it is a time-related failure and see if that changes anything. I'm going to let this get warm. Heat those components up. Sure is making it worse. Don't like that at all. And I'm not directly putting it on there. It's three seconds on, three seconds off.
So you can see there it's really pissed off now. And then let's cool them back down again. And okay, so I'm thinking that might be it. Let's uh, power this down. And uh, we'll change those transistors out. Let's see what they are first. So it looks like we got MPS8099 and MPS8599. Let's see what those are. All right, so it looks like these are pretty straightforward. Uh, 80 volt devices, uh, 625 milliwatts, uh, 500 milliamps. Let's say what the bandwidth is on these things. Yeah, 150 megahertz. Um, so let me see. I think, well, I don't think the KSAs are uh, beefy enough. Let's take a look at them real quick. Yeah, on the KSA 992, we, this is a higher voltage device. But rather than there being uh, 500 milliampers, it's only 50. Uh, and 500 milliwatts instead of 625. So, yeah, it's, that's not going to work. Uh, let's see. I don't know if I have any MPS type things. What about like an MPS A92? Yeah, like this is more like it. Uh, 200 volt device. Uh, let's see here. Yep, 500 milliampere, 625 milliwatts. That's like a higher voltage version, but it's only 50 megahertz. Uh, and it's six picofarads on the collector. Let's go back to this. Come on now. And this one was 25. Big difference. So I'm not sure if. Uh, that's going to work. We may have to, well, I mean, it could work. The worst thing that's going to happen is we're going to create an oscillation. Uh, yeah, anyways, don't mind me. I'm just looking through garbage. So the A92 is out. Let's see what else I got. Okay, so we have the MPS A06 and A56. These are 80 volt devices, half an amp, 625 milliwatts. Look like they would work. 100 megahertz. Yeah, well, what's the collector capacitance? Is that not known? We could play around with these. I mean, they'll either work or they don't work. I assume they're going to need to be matched. So we need to, uh, I have these. Let's figure out if this is going to make it work or not. Okay, so I got the NPNs out. I'm just curious. I'm going to... See if I can test and see if there's any leakage on these. Alright folks, watch the tip of that needle move. It ain't much, but it moves. Just the tiniest little bit. Moving back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So that dude's leaky. Let's check the other one here next to it. That one does not move, so he's not leaky, and if I go in the other polarity, I should get deflection. So, yeah. Um, Alright, so one of the NPNs is most certainly bad. Let me check the, uh, well actually I'm just going to match up a, a set for the NPNs here. Let me yank the PNPs out and we'll check them too. All right, so I got the PNPs out. Let's see if they give me any trouble. I should get deflection this way. But what about this way? Nope, looks good there on that one. And let's check this guy here. Tiniest little needle quiver. Just a little tiny bit. A little tiny bit. Alright. 
Now I don't know for certain if this is the cause of the noise, but what I do know is, is that one of those was definitely leaky. The other one's just a tiny little bit of leaky. And I'm going to replace all these transistors that are down here on this board. And then we're going to power it up and see uh, what we get. And they're going to be matched pairs here. So i got to take some time and do some matching with a beta tester and then we'll uh, stick them in there. All right, there's the NPNs. And now we got the PNPs. All right, so we got our MPS A06 and A56 in here. All of them have a beta of around 217. So now we uh, turn it on and see if it'll blow up or if it'll work. All right, moment of truth. Does it fly or does it fry? Hey, hey. Well, there we go. No noise. A little bit of hum there. Not terrible, but you know, that should probably be quiet. All right, let's go back to our dual trace here. And taking care of that also took care of the other channel. We got a little bit of bob from crummy regulation. Let's see where the power comes into these boards. All right, so we got a plus, mi uh, plus 42 here. And we got a minus 42 here. I don't see any separate regulation that comes in here. Uh, it goes from those two points, come on, focus, down those chokes there. We see that there's a choke there and there's a choke over there. And then that gets fed down to these points here. So there's our plus 42 and our minus 42. And let's see, what comes out of here? Minus 40. Plus 40. So maybe those are like some kind of regulator. Plus 39. Minus 39. And then you got these markings on the board here. I don't know if you can see those. I'm trying to get it to focus on you, you can see them. So like 300 picofarad between those two points there. And that says, what? Two microfarad there. Is that what that says? So, yeah. But it doesn't look like there's any any kind of real regulation here. They just run everything as is. Yeah, just poking around. There's minus 40, and there's plus 40. Let's see. Uh, I wonder if adding any additional filtering there would uh, help us out some. Relatively small currents there, so I'm not sure if it would or not, or if it would just piss it off and blow it up. We kind of have to find out. All right, so the only remaining issue at hand <clears throat> is both channels have about a quarter of a volt offset. That's the left side. That's the right side. They're both about the same. So, I'm trying to figure out a way <clears throat> that I could adjust that. You've got the 6.8K resistor that's obviously the feedback resistor for that circuit. And then you've got these two guys here, which are probably Zener diodes. That'd be my thought. Because right here, we've got my, uh, plus 39 minus 39.2. So, yeah, it's and it's bobbling around a little bit. Um, like there's our feedback, <clears throat> excuse me, and then you've got this 56k here to ground, uh, which is like part of an input loading circuit up in here. So all this really, 
excuse me, all this really is, we're going into here. This is just a buffer here. How do we control what's coming out of it? You got minus 0.8 there, and you only got plus 0.3 here, so obviously there's a current difference. So I'm not sure how to deal with that. 41, 48s, and then... So the, <coughs> excuse me, the voltage coming in here is absolute plus and minus 39. Uh, and we got the gains pretty close. Now if we come over to the other side, which uses the same setup and still has the original transistors, it's still the same quarter of a volt there at the output which annoys me. That should be zero. Freaking zero. And they both swing negative the same way. Wait a second, what just happened here? All right. Yeah, they both swing equally negative, like there's minus 0.23 there. Other channels minus 0.23 there. So it's the same on both, which makes me wonder if there's a power supply issue. You got minus 42.8 there. Plus 42.8 there. It's absolutely symmetrical. So what's going on here? Uh, is there like something in the feedback loop or something that's messing us up? Something that's drifted? Hard to know where to start on that one. That one's a bit of an oddball. But everywhere at the output you just see this... This... Uh, You know, 0 0.2 something to 0.24 volts negative. I'm trying to think of a way that we could tweak that some. You know, what's interesting is that this is direct coupled. Huh. All right. Maybe it's my generator, because I disconnected my generator. Let's disconnect the generator completely. Now, there we go. So, false alarm. My signal generator is actually the fault of the offset. So, i got to service that now. It's leaking DC. All right. Let's button this thing back up and uh, crank it up and see what it really puts out. All right, so she's all buttoned back up. Let's uh, put some real power through it and see what we get here. I'm going to stop right when it starts to round off. That looks good. Let's see what that actually is. So that's uh, 22 volts. That's about 65 watts a channel. Let's double check. So what we do is we take the uh, RMS AC voltage, square it, and then divide it by the resistive load, which is 8. So yeah, 60 watts per channel. So this thing's good to go. Thankfully it was just transistors instead of uh, this weird little sealed block things they have. And it puts out 60 watts per channel. It's healthy. Uh, <clears throat> I got took my scope my uh, signal generator apart and replaced the output uh, capacitors in it, one of which was leaky and passing some DC through to this. So this has no DC offset without the generator attached, which is good. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed watching this. Uh, more stuff to come. All right, so a bit of an update on this thing. Uh, I called the customer and told them I was done with it. <clears throat> and uh, they told me that uh, while I was fixing this, they went out and bought a replacement amplifier, and he didn't want this. So that's nice. I get stuck with it, uh, but I'm sure I'll be able to find it at home. So it is up for adoption. Um, if you're interested, message me. It's a good solid 60 watt per channel amplifier. Four output devices per channel. It's four ohm stable. Uh, but yeah, this uh, this does happen where somebody will change their mind in the middle of a thing and all get stuck with it. So, yeah. Anyways, uh, thanks for watching, guys.
and hopefully we can find this guy a home.